Welcome to the Pain Gap Podcast. Join me as I engage with experts, patients, journalists, legislators, and policy experts. Together, we'll explore intersectional health disparities and advocate for accessible, equitable health care for women of all backgrounds. Let's ignite progress and demand urgent action for women's health worldwide. Dr. Neil Shah, how are you? I'm so excited to see you and have you back on. Well, this is a new podcast, but I'm so excited to have you on the Pain Gap podcast. I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, of course, while I was re researching the book, that in, in addition to a pain gap in women's health in America, there's also a knowledge gap. And I've kind of been talking about this in, in so much of my work. What do you think about the White House um, Health Initiative, which, of course, is putting such a big spotlight on this and so much money behind it and and political force? What are your thoughts on it? I mean, of course, it's hugely exciting. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, honestly, this administration has put forth a number of initiatives related to women's health, but I appreciate that they're you know investing all the way from how do we cover people with better health care to uh, how do we make sure that we from a research standpoint, or thinking about things in a gender specific way. Yeah. And especially yeah. people, people don't always understand just for how long and even how recent it is that the image of health kind of in America is, or the standard is like this middle aged white guy. And women aren't just men with with uteruses. Who knew? Did we know this, Dr. Shaw? <laughs> I mean, or vice versa. Honestly. Right. Yeah. I mean, honestly, what's really interesting is like, from my standpoint, um, you know, Maven Clinic serves a lot of employers and we we work as an employer benefit and um, HR leaders really want gender inclusive benefits. Yes. And what's interesting is like when a person has diabetes, the non-diabetics aren't necessarily jealous of the diabetic benefit. But when there are women's health benefits, there's this really strong need to be inclusive. And so, you know, what we see is a lot of like false equivalency, like both genders deserve to be affirmed. And also there are sex specific biological differences and um we don't know enough about them um i know where we are in the, for, for the for our next question before our audience where are we in america's health maternal health crisis because despite you know so much coverage i feel like there's still a sense of denial i mean i still get asked if i'm not sure my experience almost dying giving birth in america was a was a one-off so where do you think we are in america's maternal health crisis and is the country still in denial that's a good question i can see i mean for lack of a better term has like medical gaslighting gone away no so i'm not surprised that you're hearing that from uh your audience i also would like to think optimistically that we're not in denial as a country I would too. And I, and I think that we've made real progress here. I mean, I think that going back to like 2017, 2018, you can't fix what you're not seeing and you can't see what you're not measuring. We weren't even systematically tracking maternal mortality in the United States of America until about 2018. Yeah. We didn't have the first data until about 2020. So from that standpoint, of course, we've made progress. And then, you know, through COVID, of course, you know, the pandemic took every inequity in our society and threw it into a pressure cooker whether it was gender inequity, racial inequity, geographic inequity, um, that was compounded by, you know, policies that made reproductive health care more restrictive. And so we've continued to see maternal mortality pick up. That being said, I think that maternal mortality is the lagging indicator of progress. And yes. the leading indicator is actually what's happening on the ground. And what I see happening on the ground is a proliferation of community-based energy. Um, in fact, if we're being really honest on issue, I think with the White House policies focusing on women health, it's coming from community energy. Mm -hmm. They're not just making these policies in a vacuum. Oh. It's because, you know, women and allies. Advocates, policy analysts. I mean, I'm, I'm in DC, yeah. so I know that saying, you got to be on the hill of it. <laughs> Wait, have to go. I mean, I, th I think people are demanding change. And I, and I see that uh, in real time, not only inside the Beltway, but, you know, in our work across the country. But that's so interesting that you said that because... Um, I always come across kind of uh, a resistance when people are like, well, why do you focus so much on maternal mortality? There's so much more to women's health, which of course we know. But what do you think about, because it's interesting what you just said, because the World Health Organization considers maternal mortality an overall indicator, right, of women's overall position in society, how well a healthcare system is, is um, functioning. But you're saying that the grassroots level work is a, is a larger indicator? 
Well, it's the leading indicator mm-hmm. to me. So first of all, I agree with you. Like women's health is, of course, broader than maternal health, which is part of the complication because yes. I think like for whatever reason, the fact that everyone is born seems to make us less empathetic towards each other when we go through the maternal health experience. It's like, you know, and, and moms are just inherently resilient. So no matter what a mom's experience is, my observation is that they tend to sort of normalize it and then move forward. Yeah. Um, I think that maternal health is a bellwether for societal health. So if moms are unwell, society is unwell. Mm-hmm. And that shows up in almost every injustice in our society. You can see it in maternal health. Yes, It's not just that um, racial inequity in maternal health is evidence of racism. It's that it's one of the leading indicators that racism is a clear and present danger in the United States behind maybe incarceration rates, education attainment, and other things, you know? So I think that's why maternal health is a really important bottom line indicator to the World Health Organization and others. But what I was referring to more is just that I think that the movement for birth equity in the United States is at the same place that the HIV AIDS movement was in the late 1980s, where at the beginning, the people who were most impacted were also the most disenfranchised and the most vulnerable. And the Reagan administration and pharmaceutical companies weren't doing anything. And so there was a community-based organization called ACT UP Mm -hmm. that formed in New York and probably was the most successful social movement in my lifetime. They basically held power to account. They made it so that AZT got developed and passed. They dropped mortality by 70%. They made it so that nobody in my world of research can do HIV AIDS research without a community advisory board. Um, And I see the same kind of energy right now in the birth equity. That's what I'm really referring to. Well, I'm so happy that you said that because sometimes when you're in the work world, like we are, I mean, it's nice to hear it because it's like, yes, it's true. And I feel that momentum too, but sometimes I can't tell just because it's, it's kind of like a fish being a fish in a fishbowl. Um, No, and I think you're a part of that, actually. I mean, I think, you know, um, I think we're having a moment of cultural awareness because, you know, maternal health and women's health more broadly is part of our discourse, like. The Pain yeah. Gap exists as a book and a podcast now. There are movies that yeah, are- the color of hair and documentaries too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I think all of that matters. Yeah, I agree. Well, let's give ourselves a pat on the back, Doctor. Yeah, we're making it. <laughs> That's why we do this, right? Yeah. Well, you know, it's been so exciting to watch Maven grow. I kind of feel this like weird connection to it too, because I feel like the last time you were on my other podcast. Um, I, you had just kind of, you know, it was like the doctor who's joining the digital health uh, revolution. Yeah. And so, according to the Wall Street Journal. But I love this quote that you said, joining Maven presents a unique opportunity for me to build the healthcare system I've been evangelizing for 15 years. Tell me more about wh- what your work at Maven and, and yeah. I- yeah, I mean, that's why I was excited to come back on your podcast. So we, we talked um, right when I joined and then we blinked and two and a half years went by. Yeah, I feel like a long that. time. Yeah, <laughs> um, and you know it's been it's been really exciting. I would say, I mean, and you guys are being like recognized and applauded from like Time to Disruptor of the Year. I mean, it's just, it's incredible. It's not just like oh, the startup is doing great. So it's really it's really a disruptor. So how exciting! Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people get credit for that, and I I think it's also part of what we're talking about, which is this recognition of the importance of women's health when. Um, the CEO of Maven Clinic, Kate Ryder, started Maven 10 years ago. You know, it was hard, very hard to get recognized. It was hard to get funded. It was hard to get clients. Yeah. And, you know, it's not that we're not working very hard right now, but I think that we benefit from, I'll even just tell you an anecdote. Like, I remember when we raised our last round of capital, our Series E, and we showed up at an industry conference, the health conference, which is one of the biggest uh, in our space. And... um you know, there was like this, we, we we announced our Series E at this live event where there were like thousands of other people in our space and everybody was applauding for Maven because of what it symbolized, not just for Maven as a business, but for like the whole category of women's health. That we, you know, even in a down market, this is where investors were putting their bets. Yeah. I mean, I think it's very, true. yeah. I mean, and, and you know, it's a, and the funding is important just because historically we just have not gotten in it. But even investing in, I mean, I think you guys have raised about three hundred million, if I'm correct. Yep. yep. Amazing. And just having that fact and that stat out there, you know, is something that will help other startups, especially for women's health and femtech, so much. So it's just you guys are just paving and um, 
leading the way. What are your thoughts, my next question, on the IVF ruling in Alabama? And did you ever think we were going to get here? I was like, oh, I didn't know that things could get worse. But I guess things always can. So what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I think that even if you see something coming, when it actually happens, it hits differently, right? Like emotionally. So, I mean, I think a lot of us saw the Dobbs decision coming for, you know, six months, but then the day that it was rendered, it was devastating, you know? And I, I feel similarly about the ruling in Alabama. I did not see that one coming specifically. I mean, I think at the time, post Dobbs, I understood that there were, you know, from legal uh, scholars, um, there was a lot written about the slippery slope, right? Because yeah. our rights are not these binary concepts. Our rights are interwoven into this like Jenga tower where <laughs> like, you pull out one block and everything else collapses. So you yeah. take it, right, the, the the right to access abortion care. And then it turns out that has, especially with a fully baked understanding of biology, broad implications for how we care for people when they have miscarriages or ectopic pregnancies has implications for IVF, yeah. even has implications for contraception access. Um, what's interesting though about Alabama, my observation is that even though there's a legally thin line separating IVF and abortion care, mm -hmm. the political difference was kind of remarkable to watch. Like the degree of immediate fallout and scrambling. You know, as a, a, a Republican state um, representative who happened to also be an anesthesiologist who led the drafting of the bill to put a stop gap measure in place. And of course, like when this happens, it's always like women and families who are left in the lurch, right? Imagine being mid cycle for IVFs and then oh, having goodness. it out from underneath you. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I imagine. But yeah, you're so right. The reaction, the political reaction was so different. And it, was... it was immediate. Yeah. In Up and down the ballot, both parties. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. All the way to the top. Yeah. In fact, the real sign was that I don't know if an American president in office have, has ever talked about IVF in the State of the Union before, but that's yeah. what happened last week. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the rafters were packed. Um, Elizabeth Carr, who's the first IVF baby in the United States, was at the State of the Union alongside Barb Kalura, who runs Resolve, which is an advocacy organization for fertility care, alongside many IVF doctors. Oh, seriously, fantastic. Yes. Let's hope we have our, our ducks in a row for this. Um, I wanted to ask you, what what would you think is the most important women's health issue this election cycle? Or do you think it is just women's health? I mean, now people are thinking not only about Roe, but the maternal mortality, health, the health crisis is, is on people's radar. And of course, now with IVF. But do you think there's a single issue that if you had to pinpoint that this is the issue that because the Biden administration, obviously, we're putting women's health as front and center, but it's beyond abortion. Well, I think this election matters. I think all elections matter. And I think there is absolutely no doubt that reproductive rights are on the ballot. Yeah. And that, um, well, we can leave it there. Yes. That being said, I think sometimes when people think about policy and the way that policy bleeds over into politics, it can feel like you can't do anything. Yeah. Right. So, of course, you can vote. That matters. Please vote. Also, like, policy is always going to be a blunt instrument. All it can do is fund things or not fund things or like regulate things. But underneath that, like you've got to figure out how you get services to people, you know? So I think where the real work is, of course, is always on the ground. It's at the West Alabama Women's Center in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. It's in, um, you know, the Choices Clinic in Memphis, Tennessee. It's in places like that where, you know, in spite of the significant headwinds from a policy standpoint, there are people figuring out how to deliver necessary services. That's true. true. And then sometimes it's so, it's so interesting because I always say this too, even when I feel like I get overwhelmed, but then there's such organizations that, you know, I support or I try to work with like every mother counts. And I'm like, look how practical sometimes these interventions are so simple. Um, yes. but, but anyhow, my last question, first of all, I'm so sorry to hear about a personal health setback that you had, but I'm so excited to hear about your Save the Base swim. Would you like to tell our listeners about that? And also, what, how can we support you? Oh my gosh, I get to plug my swim. That's exciting. <laughs> and, and, uh, I didn't see that one coming. Yeah. So, um, uh, I, you know, like I, I'm like 42 now. And when I was 40, I had like a, some health 
stuff happened that was like very sobering uh, that led me to try and do something that I always wanted to do, um, which is to swim across the Narragansett Bay. So there's a wow big organization called uh, Save the Bay that uh, protects and preserves the bay, um, which is between like Newport, Rhode Island, which I think a lot of people know of, uh, and Jamestown Island, which is across the bay. Uh, and so it's about a two mile swim. Um, and, uh, I'm pretty sure I'll finish. I don't think I'm a place. Oh yeah. Every morning. Um, is it like the New York ma marathon? Like, is it like a training for like six? I mean, like, tell me more about it. Cause I know a little bit about marathon training, but swim, getting ready to swim two miles. It's a lot. I mean, like, but you know, for anybody who needs inspiration, it's like, um, there's nothing like going on a podcast and telling people you're doing it to hold yourself accountable. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Or telling your five and seven year old that you're doing, um, oh, uh, um, yeah, and and so we're raising money for a good cause, and um, uh, that's it. And you know, honestly, it's 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 um, kind of an adventure. I'm training in a pool, but uh, of course, the open ocean is completely different. It's like freezing. There's like big waves, yeah. sharks. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you know, as it as it starts to warm up, I'm gonna be getting out into the ocean and um, trying to figure out how to swim. A little bit differently when is when is the race uh it's july 13th oh okay so you have some time okay because i saw you yeah. post on linkedin and i was like oh my goodness when is i hope he's not doing this no. i went public with it because like now it's like go time and like it seems like it's far away but now i'm very conscious of the gap i have to close to like make sure i can finish this race so yeah and also i was like is he trying to do some like cold plunge um <laughs> no, I, thought, I mean i know it's confusing because i'm an indian person i'm not built for i would not say i'm like not to be a stereotype but as a bangladeshi person i'm sorry i just couldn't <laughs> yeah no i will be wearing a very warm wetsuit uh, i'm gonna be wearing a burka teeny <laughs> probably, probably honestly yeah with a hood and the whole thing no i have no idea dr shaw i know you are so busy i cannot thank you enough it's always such a, an incredible pleasure and uh honor so thank you so much for coming on the show Hey, thank you, Anisha. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. And I'm excited to read you. I guess it's a new podcast. It feels like it's a, a brand new podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. No more spilling chai. But can I tell you, way too many brown people were getting on the chai train. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was one of the first, though. Thank you so much, Dr. Shaw. I'll speak to you soon. Thanks again for your Okay. Hey, great to see you. Bye. Bye.